I'm David Troy, host and co-curator of TEDx Mid-Atlantic. This video is part of a series we're creating using video conference technology during the coronavirus crisis. I'm joined today by Dr. Lena Wen. Dr. Wen is an emergency physician and public health professor at George Washington University. Previously, she served as Baltimore's health commissioner. She's a former TEDx Mid-Atlantic speaker also. Welcome, Lena. I'm happy to be with you, Dave, during these challenging times. Absolutely. So this coronavirus, it's here among us. Um, and, you know, I think we all are sort of yearning for things to return to some form of normal. But that's maybe not so easy. What, what kind of process are we looking at to learn to live with this virus over the next year or so? Mm, I mean, you're right that it is a very difficult time and actually one that I don't know that we could have imagined even weeks ago, much less months ago. I mean, when we first saw the images of what was happening out of China, and then when it became closer and closer to us, I think we began to see that this could impact us. But until it hit the US and so quickly and in such a visceral way, I don't think we processed what this really means. And I think for a lot of us, we're experiencing this in deeply personal ways. Certainly the individuals who have loved ones who have become ill or who have developed symptoms and are concerned about being ill or who have been exposed to COVID-19, the new virus themselves, they're going through pain and suffering that would be unimaginable not so long ago. But I actually think for all of us, we're all caught upon to make sacrifices in a way that, again, we might not have imagined and could not have imagined. I mean, the idea of schools being canceled, of businesses being shuttered, and us not having gatherings, even something as basic as not being able to shake hands or not being able to see relatives. Um, it's just a very different time. And I think it's a time that calls upon all of us to have a type of collective selflessness. Because for the first time, I think for a lot of us, we're seeing just how interconnected all of our fates are. I mean, we are in an interconnected world, but in this case, my health is also instrumental to your health. My being healthy and keeping my family healthy is also what's going to prevent this disease from being transmitted in the community. And we know that coronavirus is not something that only affects those who are medically vulnerable and the elderly. We know that it's something that could affect each of us. And so while it affects each of us, it's also our collective responsibility to stop the transmission of the virus from person to person. And I think it just calls upon us to make peace with those sacrifices and to understand too that if other people are making much greater sacrifices than we are, then we have an obligation to do our part. And if we don't, the selfishness of one person or 10 people could have a profound impact on the rest of society. So I think, you know, we always talk about social distancing in these times, but in a way, the social closeness and the interconnectedness of all of us is even more clear than it normally is. Absolutely. And, you know, I think in terms of timelines, um, you know, Dr. Fauci has said that, you know, we don't get to make the timeline. The virus makes the timeline. And, you know, I think that we've been looking at this as kind of an event right now where, you know, this is, we're having to very suddenly adapt to all of these kinds of changes. But I think that one of the things that, you know, we probably need to get used to is that this is something that will be with us in various ways uh, for a very long time. And, you know, we may need to go through multiple waves of lockdowns and other kinds of behavior modifications that, um, you know, will change our society. Can you give some sense of like, sort of what the process is for how we might you know, for example, start to open restaurants and go back to workplaces? Well, at the time that we're speaking right now, we're pretty far from being able to loosen the restrictions that are being placed. And that's in part because of the work that we're doing and the work that we have not done too. So you were talking about this being a process, and I think that's a very good way of, of framing it, that there is a process. 
And also that, as you were saying, quoting Dr. Fauci, that the virus is what dictates the timeline, but it's not just the virus. Yes, the virus does dictate the timeline because it's a disease and we, it's a new disease. We don't know exactly how this disease exactly operates. We don't know whether we're going to see a temporal variation um, with the seasonal variation depending on temperature. Um, but we also are not powerless against this virus either. There are very specific interventions that we can do that will change the trajectory of the disease spread. And so when we look at what's happened in other countries, we know that if social distancing measures were applied aggressively and early and consistently, that that would flatten the peak and reduce the peak rate of transmission and the total number of cases too. But if those social distancing measures were spread out over time, then, and especially if they're implemented too late, then you see a much higher peak. You see higher numbers of people who are infected. You see a longer term of infection. And unfortunately, you see more people dying because our hospitals will become out of capacity. If all these ill patients come in all at the same time, then we just don't have the resources to treat people. And unfortunately, people will die because we have to ration care. Right. And so what needs to happen is that we have to very urgently stabilize our healthcare system because that is going to be the reason for mortality and actually a reason for mortality that we just cannot forgive ourselves for if we have to ration care not only to those patients with coronavirus, but also to other patients because healthcare continues to happen. People are still going to be coming in with heart attacks and strokes and diabetes complications and other things that need hospital care. And if they cannot get care, then they will also suffer as a result. So we have to stabilize the healthcare system first. Second is we have to get mass testing because otherwise we don't know the true spread of coronavirus in our communities. And that's really important. We need data and science to guide our decision-making. And only after we're seeing number three, which is the effects of our social distancing measures, only after we're seeing the peak of the number of cases begin to decline consistently, then we can start potentially rolling back these social restrictions. And ideally we have the data at that point to roll them back one community, one region at a time, or several regions at a time, but not all at the same time. Um, and I get concerned though that because we've been late, because we have not consistently applied social distancing across the board, because we don't have widespread testing, because we haven't had the focus on strengthening our healthcare system that we need, as a result of being late, I'm afraid that that's actually going to cost us more time. And I think it just reminds me of something that um, my mentor and, um, and I know someone that you love and admire dearly, um, also a TEDx Mid-Atlantic speaker, Congressman Elijah Cummings used to say that the cost of doing nothing isn't nothing. Right. That there is a cost of inaction. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, we are seeing that cost now when we don't pay attention to public health, to prevention when we don't act quickly enough, we see that actually there will be a lot more pain and suffering and lives lost. But we need to look forward. We can't just navigate from where we wish we were. We need to navigate from where we are and we need to do everything we can. And that means continuing to make these sacrifices that will seem very difficult, but at the end of the day, they are what are life-saving. Absolutely. And in terms of testing, I mean, I think that's been cited repeatedly, and certainly you just mentioned it as a prerequisite for, uh, you know, trying to get things back on track. Um, I understand that there's a couple of different kinds of testing that are potentially available. Can you talk about, um, you know, kind of what are the constraints on testing and, and what are the different kinds that we may need in order to get back to work? So there has been some excellent reporting done about the missteps in testing and why it is that the U.S. is so far behind other countries when it comes to having widespread testing capacity. I think in general, it has to do with lack of anticipation, because even after tests were actually being produced and distributed, 
Then we found out that the swab that was used, that's used to actually get the test, that that was in short supply. And then we found out that the reagent used to process these tests were in short supply. And so it's one thing after the other. And then, then there was the problem with personal protective equipment, that if nurses and doctors and healthcare workers don't have the equipment to actually collect tests in a safe manner, then you can't do the test either. And so I think that's been one trend along the way that so much of the, of the process um, of, of combating COVID-19 has been looking at what's already happened instead of anticipating what we need going forward, which is something that I hope that will be changed. But looking forward to testing the things that we do need and are on the horizon, one is point of care testing. You can't have people wait five, six days for a test result. That's not practical in a clinical setting and it doesn't make sense for public health measurement to be looking at something that happened a week ago. You need point of care testing, meaning testing that's done at the bedside available within the hour. And there are now tests that are being developed to, um, to, to, uh, to this extent that are really important. The second thing is you need to look at not only the tests for whether somebody has an acute infection now, ideally we also get to the serology test, looking at antibodies, because there are people who may have had coronavirus and may have had no symptoms or mild symptoms or because of lack of testing never got tested it would be good to find out if there are people out there in the community who have immunity already to coronavirus, because that would certainly change how they interact with society. And they might be the first ones to be able to return to work, or you can imagine if they were frontline healthcare workers, it gives them a level of protection as well. And then the third thing about testing is you need it to be widespread. Everyone who has symptoms should get tested. Everyone who has exposure should be tested. And beyond that, we need surveillance testing so that we understand, is it that 50% of the people who are walking around actually have coronavirus and are spreading it and just don't know it? Or are we talking about 1% or 0.1%? That level of surveillance and understanding is also critical to public health, to guide public health measures moving forward. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, at the moment, we don't have very good visibility into the spread. And, uh, you know, I think that puts a lot of future decisions into, you know, uh, uncertainty. Um, In terms of, you know, more final uh, kinds of resolutions to this, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of work being done on both treatments and on vaccines. Um, My understanding is is that, you know, most uh, vaccines probably would be like at least a year, but probably more like 18 to 24 months out on the horizon. Um, can you give a sense of, um, you know, what we might expect in terms of vaccines? Sure. So COVID-19, as you know, is a new disease, which means that nobody has immunity to it naturally because it hasn't been around it, there also is no vaccine and no proven treatment as of yet because of how new it is. Treatments could be developed a lot sooner because there are existing medications that are um, antivirals or have other properties that are promising. And, um, and there are already clinical trials underway with multiple of these potential treatments. But ideally, what we need to get to is what you said, Dave, which is getting to a vaccine that will prevent us as much as possible from contracting COVID-19 in the first place. And that is the development of that vaccine and being able to roll that out worldwide, that will be the real game changer. That's when we can all go back to as much as life as normal as, as, as we knew it before. Now, developing a vaccine for a novel disease is very challenging. It has to go through multiple phases. They have to demonstrate safety and efficacy. And importantly, it's not just about developing the vaccine, it's also about making enough. Because when we think about vaccine, we think about the moment at which the vaccine gets to people, not just the moment at which it gets approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And so you're right that the timeline, I think the most ambitious timeline is 12 months, a more realistic is 18 months, and it may take even longer. And I think that kind of timeline underscores why these other preventive measures and really drastic measures that we're taking when it comes to social distancing are so important. Because if we don't implement these measures, then we're looking at, some models show, 40 to 60% of the American population 
contracting coronavirus. And if there's a death rate of one to 3%, that's millions of Americans who could die in the next year. We have an opportunity to change that and reduce the number of deaths. But without a vaccine, those types of social distancing measures are our best bet and what each of us has to do. No, absolutely. I, I think that's uh, you know very good advice. And in terms of um, you know what what kind of advice would you maybe pass on to people that are watching this at home? Um, you know, as we enter into this period of living with this virus, this process of starting to manage it and then ultimately try to bring it under control. If there was one piece of advice that you could give to you know people watching this as a public health professional, what might it be? The one piece of advice, well, maybe I can give several pieces of advice if I can. Sure, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, maybe three pieces of advice. The first is that there are tangible things that we can do in order to reduce our own risk. And very specifically, the one thing that I think everyone has come to know in the last several weeks to months is the importance of hand and face hygiene, which I hope is something that we'll keep up even long after coronavirus is under control. I hope we'll keep on these, um, these types of good personal hygiene practices, washing hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and water, using hand sanitizer if that's not available, stop touching our face or touch our face less. I think those are good practices regardless and are things that we should continue to keep in mind. The second is around social distancing. You know, it, there is a social media campaign that a number of healthcare workers have launched that really breaks my heart every time I see it. And that's healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, pharmacists, um, respiratory therapists, everyone who works in this holding up signs that say, I stayed at work for you please stay at home for me. And sometimes we think about what good am I doing just sitting on the couch watching Netflix? You know, it doesn't feel like we're contributing to the greater societal good. But I want people to know that that is the single most important thing that you can do to reduce the rate of transmission of COVID-19. This new coronavirus is spread person to person. And if we are able to stop that transmission in its tracks, we're stopping the virus in its tracks. And the single most important thing you can do is actually to stay at home and watch Netflix, if you will, <laughs> and to physically distance your, yourself, understanding how challenging that is. I mean, I'm about to give birth at the moment that we're speaking, actually. I'm, we we yeah. caught you at the last possible moment, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, and I, I mean, right after having the baby, I won't be able to have any visitors. I won't have any family over, any friends over. And it's a big change for, for me, as it is for a lot of people, to go through this period of physical distancing. But that is what I need to do. That is what we need to do. And that's the single most important thing in order to save lives. And I'll just add one more thing. The third thing that um, I think for all of us is that we know we're facing this period of uncertainty. And a lot of people, everyone has given up a lot, some people more than others, but everybody is going through a lot. And I think the last thing that I'll leave people with is that this is our opportunity to face this uncertainty with solidarity and recognize the cooperation and collaboration that we all need. And that to tolerate that uncertainty is also a level of sacrifice too and that we should be granting each other grace and recognizing each other's humanity even more than we ever have. That's beautiful. And, you know, we were so pleased to be able to have you here today. I know you've got a lot going on and, uh, you know, we all wish you the best, um, you know, as you uh, head off to have, give birth and uh, bring another life into this world. Um, you know, it, it's such a challenging time. But again, thank you so much for you know sharing your wisdom with us today, and um, I think that this will help people understand you know what it's going to be like to actually live through this together. So thanks again. Thank you, Dave.